Hello, and welcome to the Funds for NGOs podcast. We are Funds for NGOs, an online platform that supports nonprofit organizations around the world with resources and knowledge to help them grow and succeed. Today, we're speaking with Lily Beadle from the Carbon Trust about an exciting initiative called ZGen, which is bringing clean solar power to communities that need it most. Lily, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And perhaps to kick us off, could you explain a little bit more about ZGen and a competition I understand that's involved? That's right. Yeah, ha very happy to explain ZGen. So uh, it's a program um, called the Zero Emissions Generator Program. And we're looking at the issue of fossil fuel generators um, that are their products that are used ubiquitously across the globe in place of grid infrastructure. Um, we're thinking petrol and diesel engines, essentially, that are um, the, the kind of power uh, sites that are either completely not connected to the grid or that are where the grid is unreliable and they step in as backup. And whilst they've been convenient products, there's there are some negatives to their use. So they're, um, in, in many countries increasingly expensive to use, or there's an access of fuel. You've got people queuing for hours for, for petrol and diesel. Um, and the maintenance of such systems is, is pretty expensive. Uh, and in particular in areas where, there, where it's either built up, like urban areas or in industrial settings, there's a ton of pollution. So there's quite negative climate and health impacts. So um, we're asking the question at, the Z, at ZGen, what can renewable energy do? So the, the Carbon Trust is one partner of many uh, leading this, and we're a net zero organization focused on kind of all sorts of decarbonization across the globe um, and feel that this is yeah an area that is uh, of high, yeah, high potential for decarbonization, but also to transform people's lives. Um, and so we're working with a range of different partners to look at different forms of renewable energy and how they could step in place of, of kind of such fossil fuel generation. And we're thinking about it in a couple of different ways. Um, what we're really trying to achieve is reaching a market tipping point. So how do we get renewable energy to the point where it can step in affordably and reliably in a clean way, investing in innovation to make sure that there's the right sorts of product and hardware available, investing in different financial mechanisms to make sure that we can actually fund such a transition, and working with communities to um, help understand what, crucially, what their needs are and what their wants are, um, and how to kind of um, uh, you know, improve understanding about solar and, and the models behind it. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a really great initiative. We're we're proud of it. Quite new, <laughs> um, but yeah, we've um, and we've launched recently a partnership with an organisation called Clasp and uh, their Verisol program. And um, the intent of that particular partnership is to encourage competition and uh, inspire innovation, and also um, start to ensure that the whatever renewable energy steps in place is of a high enough performance as well. It's absolutely crucial that the renewable energy products that we um, invest in are, are of a, you know, a high enough standard for people. So um, they've done a fantastic job of setting this up. We'll be um, launching the, the awards later this year. And the idea is that people apply into them. The final comment I make is um, we're, we're kind of focusing on this, on what we'd call distributed renewable energy. Um, so I mentioned kind of grid infrastructure. It's absolutely important that nations do invest in that. And they, and in many settings that we're looking at across Africa, South Asia, the Pacific, they are. And, but we're asking, well, what can smaller forms of energy do to step in place, um, that can provide a transition more quickly and, and potentially in certain settings more cost effective? The partnership with CLASP is a big part of that, of kind of testing out these new systems to see, uh, what could work. Wonderful. And as they say, many hands make light work. And I, I don't think you're, what you're doing is light work at all. Um, <laughs> huge. But I think with the combination of several organizations and a lot of committed people, you certainly increase the chances for success. So yeah, wonderful. we hope so. <laughs> Absolutely. And why solar in particular? Why is that so important for areas that do not have other reliable electricity sources? Well, in many of the settings we're looking at, first and foremost, is quite sunny. So solar does work quite well. It's also, we've seen significant drop costs, uh, you know, d d decreasing costs of, of um, solar in particular. Um, and uh, the 
we're, we're sort of looking for products that can drop in in place of, of fossil fuel generators. So we're looking for things that are a similar size um, and a similar kind of cost bracket. And solar fits that quite neatly. So it's a combination of, of that particular technology and type of solution uh, becoming more successful worldwide. And also it's being quite adaptable to these, these settings um, to yeah, drop in place of, of the previous systems to allow people to kind of own their own energy, really. Perfect. And would it be fair to say that uh, sunny regions are the ones most applicable for this solution? And, um, so we're looking at countries across, uh, low to low middle income countries across Africa, South Asia and the Pacific. Um, it's typically where most fossil fuel generators are used. I mean, they're used all over the place where there, where there isn't grid kind of or reliable grid connectivity. Um, but they, those kind of nations are particularly reliant on it. So and yeah. That they are kind of sunnier locations, um, but really it's the it's the cost point as well in trying to make sure that this electricity for people is affordable. Um, and whilst we don't just focus on solar, this particular initiative um, with CLASP focuses on the kind of solar solar generators that can drop in place of fossil fuel um, kind of petrol and diesel generators, essentially. Wonderful. And that's smart. I mean, if you develop a solution, but no one in the region can afford it to take advantage. Indeed. Then what's the point? Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely critical. I think affordability, well, across all forms of electricity, wherever you are, is is, is obviously key. But um, when for for many of the, in particular for the smaller systems, if we think about a, a petrol generator, um, you know, this is the, this is people's livelihoods and a, a quite an, a, a big capital outlay for people. Um, and so it's yeah, it's really important to make sure that the the price is right and also that the, you know the financing is there to support people and that these things can last as well. Which is why yeah, it's great to, great that Clasp is working on the on the performance and status side of things. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you tell us more about the competition? What what exactly is it, and how does that work? So companies can will be able to apply into it, and um, the history of the Verisol program is that they have um, looked at all sorts of uh, standards, performance criteria for uh, various different types of solar products. So this is kind of a new product category for them, and when companies apply in, their products will be tested against certain performance standards. And so really, what we're looking at is um, well, first of all what's out there this is a relatively new market so what are the sorts of things that companies are developing what are the solutions and um yeah are they what what kind of perf what how high can we push that performance essentially of those products um and that's that's a kind of first step that we would expect to take for for a new market where you're encouraging high performance without necessarily setting up certifications or standards. But what we hope is that this market will expand and then that will lead on to kind of standards and certifications being set up. So this is kind of the first step in that in that process. Um, and Wonderful. so we'll be launching the awards uh, shortly um, and companies will be able to climb with the products to get tested and see. Excellent. Excellent. And I assume there'll be more information for nonprofits and community-based organizations yep, that want absolutely. to participate about how to do that. Yep, absolutely true. Um, so for any organization that is um, developing these sorts of products, they can they can apply in to the, if, if their kind of product meets the criteria set by CLASP. Um, I also think that one of the important outcomes to come out of this is a kind of list of what organizations are doing out there. So if you're a and organizations that's thinking about switching to renewable energy in, in some of these countries, then you can kind of go to this list as, as a trusted list of, of suppliers, essentially. So, uh, yeah, potentially dual opportunity there. Excellent. Excellent. And can you talk a little bit more about uh, the benefits? I mean, obviously, in much of the world, electricity power is taken for granted. Um, it's just always there. It's on demand, available anytime we want it, anytime we need it. Talk about the difference that it can make for a community where that's not the case, where reliable power is not a given. Absolutely. So, the, I mean, the scale of it is, you know, there's, there's something like 1.5 billion people worldwide without reliable access, as chronic or unreliable access. And, you know, within that, it's something like 700 million without any access at all. Uh, another number to throw out there, clean cooking, 2 billion people without access to clean cooking. So it's a significant proportion of people, uh, you know, the world's population that doesn't have access to a lot of modern services. And we just, I mean, from everything from the way that you cook um, to the ability of hospitals to provide care with life-saving equipment, you know, women giving birth in the dark, for example, to 
everything to do with business, yeah. you know, is often, you know, electricity is the backbone of it, whether it be powering an incubator for chickens or, um, you know, manufacturing. It's just so much of our, our kind of modern life is powered by electricity and digital connection. And so if you're a community that isn't able to access that or is, um, you know, your ability to realise your full potential is is limited by, um, you know, uh, having less access than than is desirable, then um, yeah, it becomes tricky tricky to kind of succeed. So we really think that it's everything from day to day life to you know the ability to uh, improve kind of economic development. Uh, it's yeah, it's the it's the backbone to a lot of what we do. Wow, and those statistics are just astounding to me. Mm. Uh, Seven hundred million without reliable power, and did you say two billion uh, without? cooking yes um, that's right so that's two billion people that are you know walking several hours to find firewood for example or cooking on kind of you know dirty forms of fuels that often pollute their homes and things like that so you know it's not that people aren't resourceful but it's it's you know we're, it's important to think about are there other products that can be more cost effective uh, and healthier for people absolutely well, as children, we're, we all think we'd love to grow up to change the world. And it seems like your organization is trying to do just that. What, what global impact do you hope this would have going forward? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we are very much reliant on the success, you know, the, the hard work and success of all of the partners that we work with, in particular in country. So it's brilliant to, to have um, yeah, such a network of people working on this issue. We are... I mentioned this idea of a market tipping point. So really, we feel like we'll have um, done our job if, if, these, if the sorts of organizations that are trying to pursue renewable energy and the kind of communities that are trying to access this, um, you know, if, if it, once we see that transition properly starting, that's when we can kind of take a step back. But in order to create these markets, to introduce the right forms of, forms of policy, encourage financing into the right place it needs to be supported in in all sorts of different ways so we're hoping that by kind of studying different settings understanding different energy systems and infrastructure we can um yeah reach reach that tipping point that that kind of private sector um funding kind of floods in and it is in in many cases i mean a lot of the companies we've worked with over the past couple of years are already seeing success both um from a customers wanting to buy their products, which is a good thing, <laughs> to also investors wanting to invest in their businesses as well. So it is it is starting to happen, but a lot of it's very nascent and there's still a lot to do to, to lower costs and find the right ways to make these things successful. Um, because it's an incredibly complex debate. I mean, whether you, if you look at, say, for example, a marketplace in Nigeria, um, you can remove a petrol generator from a micro entrepreneur and put it in, in, in that place. It could be a solar generator. It could be a mini grid. It could be improved grid infrastructure. What will work will very much depend on policy environments, financing, kind of the will of customers and ability to pay. So it is a very nuanced conversation. But yeah, we're hoping that by encouraging the right sorts of innovation, finance, et cetera, that um, we can open up markets in a, in a range of different places. Wonderful, wonderful. And being a non-governmental organization, um, it begs the question, are there any governments that you find resistance from? In other words, I'm assuming all of the people, all of the two billion would welcome reliable energy. But are, I'm just curious, are there some governments who take advantage of the fact that the people do not have power to justify their existence? It's a it's a great question. Um there are a ton of it's very very um complex depending on what region you look at. I think there are in many countries, in particular the regions that we're looking at right of of Africa, South Asia, and the Pacific, there is a certain push in particular if you kind of make a climate argument about it of well, these aren't really the settings that are driving most of the emissions, so really the priority should be how do we get the most access at the lowest price. And if it's clean, that's a benefit. So there is, that's a kind of first pushback. The second is those nations' ability to invest and set up policy, both from a, uh, I guess, capacity perspective in so much as it's often, they're often under-resourced teams, just in terms of the number of people working on it and um, the time it takes to figure out what the right sources of tariffs should be, et cetera. Um, as well as, you know, 
the, the the money it takes to encourage such a transition um they can't often afford subsidies although yeah the 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 lobbying of fossil fuel is is quite uh uh strong in a lot of the countries we're looking at so it's a very nuanced debate there are but increasingly you see governments wanting to set their targets um you know for for many of the key countries where historically they've been very either coal or oil driven, you are starting to see a shift purely because these things are starting to, you know, the economics behind renewable energy is really, um, it's, uh, you can't argue against it <laughs> in many settings. So um, it's, we are, I mean, for I can, can give some examples. So um, in Nigeria, they removed um, kind of fossil fuel subsidies, which, which whilst I think has sort of it's had mixed results in so much as it might have been reversed, etc. Um it's it's things like that which uh, even if we haven't quite got the right answer in all cases, nations are starting to show that they're interested in it. The, another challenge I would say is we're seeing a real shift in how development finance is is um well, it's just being reduced, right, in terms of USAID or AID, rather. Um, we're seeing cuts across the UK, across Europe. And so where typically you might see subsidy coming in to support some of this work, there's there's been a massive decrease in funding for that. It's a, it's a complex, a complex arena to read <laughs> in terms of where people's motivations lie. But I think there is momentum behind it, uh, in particular now that the economics behind so much of renewable energy is is looking really strong. And uh, yeah, it's just about continuing that that momentum behind some of the change, and also arguing for for uh, subsidy to still be in place. Absolutely, and I imagine that it's work that will never be done. Um, you know, it. Uh, but but if you make it one difference for one community in terms of reliable power. That's got to be a great feeling for for the organization. Yeah, I think for us, we um, so much of the work that we're doing on ZGen is about demonstrating those solutions and the idea that if you can showcase that something works in one setting, I mean, not always translatable, but the idea is that you should be finding things that can achieve scale. So um, the hope is there's that that continues to to happen. Um, obviously, the geopolitics is, <laughs> is is a complicated one to try and influence. So, um, but yeah, we are we are seeing real momentum behind it, which is encouraging. Wonderful, wonderful, Lily. It all sounds really exciting. And for those who are interested in how to get involved, uh, what steps can they take? So, if they're an organisation that's working within the world of renewable energy, or potentially considering things like carbon credits for um for their to kind of fund their operations um all sorts of things we do a ton of work within that beyond zgen as well so um feel free to check out our website to see what the kind of latest funding calls are and also get in touch if you have any ideas for partnership we're also um you know this this partnership with classes is our first step into building out that picture of who's you know what are the what are solar distributors doing out uh, out in the world and um you know, building that list of reliable products. So if you are an organization um, in kind of settings across uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and the Pacific, then um, you can engage with hopefully the competition competition to see whether in your market, whether there are products that you can purchase. Um, other than that, yeah, hopefully some some interesting reads on the website. Um, but yeah, do get in touch if, if there's anything of interest. Wonderful. Wonderful. Lily, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a terrific discussion and uh, a very exciting initiative. It's really inspiring to hear how initiatives like ZGen and CLASP are helping communities transition to clean energy solutions. And to our viewers, we'll share links to ZGen and the CLASP Global Leap Solar Competition in the description. This has been another episode of the Funds for NGO podcast. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next episode.